Isaiah 58, we're going to read, um, tell you what, who would like to read 58, 1 through 5? Gotcha. Okay. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate and to strike with a fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Amen. Okay, so what's going on here? is the prophet Isaiah is talking to the, to the people of Judah, and the people of Judah have been fasting one day and expecting God to do great things. <laughs> and not only that, but they are very worldly people. So in other words, they're just, I, I, I put a scripture down here, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And if you look at some of the notes I put down here, uh, so they were going through the motions. You know, they were going to church, so to speak, and oh, praise the Lord, hallelujah, and all that kind of stuff. But their heart was a long way from God. And so God wasn't answering their prayers because their hearts weren't right with God. And that's what he's basically saying in these first five verses. Um, <clears throat> the people seem to take real pleasure in going through the prescribed daily rituals. We do that. We go through our little Christian rituals. Um, a lot of the people in this particular time, they, what we call sanctimonious, they were holier than thou. But again, their heart was a long way from God. Okay? Um, in fact, they accuse God of being indifferent to their fast and acts of contrition, but God accuses them of self gratification, taking advantage of their employees, and a fist fighting in the midst of their fasting. That's what's going on here. Theirs is not, it sounds like the Corinthian church that we have in the New Testament. Theirs is not the kind of fasting that counts with God. True fasting is not a matter of physical posture or an outward display of mourning. It's more of an attitude of the heart. And, uh, you know, if you're fasting, you fast for the right reasons. You want to fast to get to know God better, to find His direction, to find a closer relationship with Him. These are the reasons why we fast. Amen? Okay. And then, and this chapter 58 is probably the best description of fasting in the Bible. Okay? Let's keep going. We're going to go, Isaiah, who wants to read Isaiah 58, 6 and 8? 6 through 8. Isaiah 58, 6 through 8. Okay, go ahead. If this is the kind of fasting I want, free those who are wrongly imprisoned, lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from relatives who need your help. Was it five through eight? Yeah, through eight. Then your salvation will come like the dawn and your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. So what he's saying here is this is the kind of fast that God is, uh, you know, pleased by. You know, He wants us to put a little feet to our faith instead of just talking about all the good things we do or going to do. He wants us to actually do them. Okay? To loose the bonds of wickedness. It reminds me of some scripture I just thought of right here as we were reading that in, in uh, Matthew 25 where He says, um, let me get to it real quick. He says, For when I was hungry, you gave me food. Uh, when I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was a stranger, you took me in. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you came to me. Amen. Mm -hmm. So that's what he's talking about here in this, these few verses that we were just talking about. To undo heavy burdens. Are we going out and helping the people that need help? Because that's the kind of fast God is honored with. Uh, to let the oppressed go free. In this church, we try to help people that are in bondage. 
We have a recovery class. People get in bondage to different things. So we're supposed to be helping people get out of bondage. And then it says um, that we break every, it says to undo heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you may break every yoke. The Bible says the anointing breaks the yoke, Isaiah 10, 27. <coughs> so the anointing of God, you, you hear it said in this church a lot that the Holy Spirit is here. And the Holy Spirit is the one that guides us into truth, and it's the Holy Spirit that, that sets us free from the things that we have been bound to. The anointing breaks the yoke, not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit, saith the Lord. Amen? So, Pastor, what it sounds like is we take our, when we're going into this fast, we take our, yeah, our minds off of our self, and our self molding our lives. <coughs> Concentrate, focus on other people, and in, 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 in your own battles and in your own struggle, God will heal you. You know when you right. redirect. Right. Is that what I'm understanding? Exactly. You only get to keep what you give away. So if you're looking for freedom, help other get people get free. If you're looking for financial stability, give money away. Be a tither. Whatever you give away in the kingdom, the kingdom's opposite of what we think. We think take, 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 push people out of the way, whatever the case may be, but God says give and it will be given to you. Help others get free. Help others get out of the yoke of bondage. Anybody else? This is the fast that God is pleased with. And by the way, I'm not much of a faster. It's been a long time since I fasted. And... Um, I'm glad I'm doing this chapter tonight because I got convicted. So I'm the kind of guy that wakes up early in the morning and eats, like at 4.30, because I'm hungry. And then I eat all day, about every three or four hours, and my metabolism's going bzzz. So Cheryl goes, oh, you can't fast. You, you'll be miserable. Your blood sugar will be out of whack and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I said, well, it might be, but if God wants me to fast, I'm going to do it. So anyway. And I want to encourage other people to, to ask God if He wants them to fast too. See, we have Easter coming up. What's that? Wait until Scott gets there before you fast. Wait, what? Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, shock. <laughs> so we have Easter coming up, and we know that there's people that come to church just because it's Easter. So what I was planning on doing, I'm not going to do anything until Monday. So what I was thinking about doing was doing all the stuff I need to do on Monday and then that night eat my last meal at 6 and then go 24 hours till the next day. So I was going to do a one day fast and pray for the services that are coming up through this Easter holidays. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the, we have the Passover meal. We have, um, you know, we, um, we have the Easter service. And so there's going to be a lot going on and there'll be an opportunity for God to move. And this is the kind of things we pray and fast for is the, you know, the renewing of people's souls through Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. And during that fast, uh, fast what, do, like, what is consecration? When you consecrate yourself the entire period of your fast. You totally give yourself to the Lord during that time. The whole time. The whole, yeah, you just give yourself to the Lord. A good thing to do is read the Word, read some of the Psalms, pray. Um, the gospel music. Yeah, pray, yeah, just spend some time with the Lord. And if you have to go about your daily business, then, you know, you can uh, pray and read the Word at breakfast time when you'd normally be eating, uh, eating breakfast or at noon time when you'd normally be doing dinner. You can do stuff at that particular time of the day, too. So you consecrate that entire period <clears throat> onto the Lord. Yes, yes. So I want to read this uh, 6 um, through 8 again. I want to show you something in the Word. So in verses 6 and 7, he tells us what to do. So I called that in the notes, I called that exhortation. He's exhorting us to loose the bonds of wickedness, undo heavy burdens, share your bread with the hungry, that you bring your house to the poor who are cast out. You see the naked and you cover them. Hide not yourself from your own flesh. So he tells us what he wants us to do, but then in the next verse... Verse 8 and part of 9, he tells you what happens. So, I like to look at God as a cause and effect. In the Old Testament, he said, if you obey me, then all these things will happen to you. These good things. 
How many like good things? I like the good things. Amen? And I, and I always bring up my past, but it's interesting how God showed me. I, I broke a lot of laws. Don't even, I don't want to even talk about that, but I was a law breaker. Today I want to be a law uh, keeper. And a lot of people don't like to hear the keeping of the law in church today because we always say we're under grace, not the law. But we need to keep the laws because it makes life on earth paradise. Are you with me? So, well, I don't have to keep the law. Uh, okay, well, you, you don't have to. You can, you know, squeak in through heaven and you might get burned up. It says and he'll burn up all your junk in 1 Corinthians 3, but you'll make it in smelling like smoke. But you'll have a miserable life on earth. So he, that's the truth. You ought to read it. I'll read it to you. 1 Corinthians 3. Let me turn over there. 1 Corinthians. Let me show you what it says. Well, yeah, you smell like smoke, but you'll get there. <laughs> it starts 315, 1 Corinthians. So let me tell you about the law. And uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of the laws of God. All of them. Not the ceremonial laws. The law will not save you. So don't hear what I'm not saying. The law cannot save you. But if you want a good life, Charles Finney believed in that. John Wesley believed. All those great preachers believed in the law. Adrian Rogers. I got a clip today from Adrian Rogers. God, it was powerful about keeping the commandments of God. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And my commandments are not burdensome. You say you love me, keep my commandments. 1 John 5. There's a bunch of them. Anyway, so um, let me just read this to you. 1 Corinthians 3, 15. <clears throat> if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so through fire, and he'll stink a little bit. Do you not know that you're the temple of the God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, he will destroy you, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So you've seen a person that's been in church and they're saved, they could be saved, but they lived a life that uh, wasn't real pleasing to God and it, it took a toll on their temple. You've seen people like that? A hard life? Just real quick, did you say 1 Corinthians 3.15? 3.15. What does yours say? Read yours. Is it one of those uh, living translation or something? No. I was in the wrong area, so. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. He's <laughs> Actually, if we want to read it, we go back up. But back up to verse 12. It says, If anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it. Because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. But some of it will be burned up because it wasn't done for the right motives. But you'll still be saved. And what I'm trying to say, it started off me talking about the laws. God wrote those laws for human beings. Not, now, some people say they were just for the Jewish people. At that time, that's true. But we're all human beings. We all bleed red. We all breathe the same oxygen. There's all the people in the world. We're no different. We all have a soul. Amen? I'm speaking of the Ten Commandments, the dietary laws, the agriculture laws, the monetary laws. Those are all good things to keep if you want to know how to have a good life on this earth. Do I get an amen on the monetary laws? Oh, she was talking to me. I was, no, I thought y'all were. I thought y'all were nudging each other. Go ahead. Well, when I was a very young person, I had a pastor that often would say, "If there were no heaven to gain and no hell to shun, I would still want to live the kind of life a Christian ought to live." Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what you just said, following the laws, it just it's just going to make life a lot nicer here. It does. Take it from experience. I broke the law. It doesn't work. And that was, that was the laws of the government or society. But I look at those as these are laws to help us live the best life we can. Charles Finney said, if you were to take a group of people to a remote island and give them the Bible to live by, and they followed the rules in the Bible, they would live in utopia. <laughs> it's the truth. God's grace. Yeah, God's grace. We need God's grace for sure to be saved. 
But this, just keeping the laws make life better for you. So when you hear people say that we're not under law but under grace, technically that's absolutely correct. But that doesn't mean that you want to go out and live like a crazy guy and heathen and destroy your body and everything around you. Okay? I need a handbook for life. What? The handbook for good living. It is. That's a good way to put it. So let me go over here. I, I was sharing with you that 6 and 7 is an exhortation on how and what God wants us to do. And then, so God says, if you do this, I'll do this. And He does that all through Scripture, especially in the Old Testament. You do this, I'll do this. If you fall away from me and come back to me, I'll restore everything you lost. That's God. God's a good God. So let's read verse 8. This is the promise. So first we had the exhortation or the conditions to get the promise. Then the promise comes in verse 8. We're going to see this again in just a minute. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily. How many need healing? Amen. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. How many need somebody to, to uh, cover your back? Let me, let me stop for just a minute. It's not in your notes. I'm going to go to Isaiah 30. Hold your, hold your place. I'm just going to go over here real quick and read you something. How many need a rear guard? I need somebody that has my back. Yep. You've heard that on the streets. Anybody that used to do the street? I got your back. Yep. Maybe you had a buddy that said, I got your back. Mm-hmm. Maybe you had a best friend that says, no matter what, I got your back. Well, we got, we got God that says, I got your back. Mm-hmm. And then in Isaiah 30, verse, I lost my place now, 21. 30, 21, it says, your ears, 30, 21, Isaiah, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. I need somebody to tell me which way to go. Like a guide. Yeah, like a guide. <laughs> Does anybody else need a God? Yeah. Hallelujah. Because I'm a knucklehead left of my own devices. He says, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left, I will be with you. <laughs> Isaiah 30, verse 21. So these are the promises. Uh, and then he says, I'll be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer and you will cry and he will say, here I am. So you obey God, you go through the exhortation of doing what He asks us to do, and then good things start to happen. Amen? Amen. Let's go to, um, I'm going to stop in Isaiah for a minute and go through some of the other stuff I put down about fasting. Like I said, I was glad I did this. I was glad I got to this place, because I got really convicted. I thought, I never fast. And it should, do you know that in the days of Jesus, it was just commonplace for people to fast? Mm-hmm. It wasn't like they worked out. They just were supposed to fast. Even the Pharisees fasted, but for the wrong reasons. They wanted everybody to say, oh, look at them. They were all pious and religious. and Amen. But people fasted. It's actually healthy for you. How many have heard of the Daniel fast? Okay. There's some fast. That, that's a good one. We're going to get to that in just a minute. <clears throat> so how, God has many fasts in the Bible. Did you know that Moses fasted for 80 days? Wow. That's not possible to do that, by the way. Uh, but So he had to have the Spirit of God to help him do that. He went up on the mountain the first time, 40 days, 40 nights. He got the tablets of stone, Ten Commandments, written by the finger of God. And he came down and they were worshiping the golden, golden image, just like today. No different. People are worshiping the golden image. Sex, sexual immorality, money, gold, power, all that stuff that we have. And so God got mad, or actually Moses got mad first, broke the tablets, then he had to go back. So all this happened in one day. The day he got down from the mountain with the first set, he broke them. Some people believe it was actually 81 days because he was there with the people for one day. Then he went back up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights and got the second tablets and came back down. God, I hope you never ask me to do 80 days. Maybe 80 hours, but not 80 days. Okay. Daniel 1.12. Daniel, if you know anything about Daniel, he was a, very, he was a man very close to God. Mm-hmm. It'd be cool to sit down and talk to Daniel. He's the one that had so many visions and, wow, he could interpret dreams and he was incredible. And if you look at his prayer life, and his fasting, you kind of get a glimpse of why the guy was the way he was. He was totally dedicated to God. 
Daniel 1.12 said, this is where, you know, they wanted to feed the, the guys that had just been taken into captivity. I call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego instead of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Because uh, most of us know about those other names we learned in Sunday school and we're a little, little peep squeaks. And um, so anyway, they wanted to feed them royal food like the rest of the Babylonians were eating. And Daniel said, please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Anyway, after the 10 days, they were smarter than all the other Babylonian young people. 10 times smarter, it says. And so fasting has some wonderful benefits. In Daniel 9.3, 9, this is when Daniel starts having all these visions about the second coming of Christ. Daniel uh, 24 through 26, the nine the 70 weeks and all that stuff that we use for prophecy. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. I put a note here. Sackcloth is made of goat's hair, which is itchy and uncomfortable. Do you think those people were serious about getting humble before God? <laughs> These were all signs of being broken and uh, having a contrite spirit. And humbling themselves. Ashes, you know how they put ashes on their head and forehead and all that. Um, the ashes on top of his head signified desolation and ruin. Daniel 10, 2 and 3. And Daniel had an incredible vision in this chapter. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks fasting. I ate no pleasant food, no meat. Or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all, any lotions or any of that stuff, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Okay? So Dan, Daniel was a man that fasted. Then we're going to look at another man. His name was Jehoshaphat. If you have any questions, raise your hand because I'll get all wound up and this is supposed to be interdiscussional. Jehoshaphat. He had some people called the Ammonites and the Moabites coming against him and the people. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So that'd be like that'd be like Sunday morning, Pastor Scott getting out up here and saying, and you know how he is sometimes. I'm not asking you, I'm telling you to go vote. He'll, you know how he does that sometimes? I'd make you if I could. <laughs> yeah, I'd make you if I could. So he'd be up here and he'd go, Everybody needs to fast this week at least two days. Period. <laughs> That's what they did right there. That's what Jehoshaphat did. He says, all of the people, this is what you're going to do. You're going to fast and pray. And the story goes that as they began to sing and praise the Lord, the, the enemies ended up killing each other and they got the victory. So God, through the power of prayer, fasting, and supernatural deliverance, they had this wonderful miracle. No. This year, um, coming into the year 2023, uh, I'm just giving my spirit to pass out the 26th of December to the 7th of uh, January. And during that time, I consecrated myself and I fasted, and deliverance came. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, my life. and it's court and things came off of me. Some things only come by fasting and prayer and supplication. Some difficult things only come by this is scripture. By fasting and prayer. Yep. So you know those more <coughs> challenging things in your life that you prayed about and prayed about and prayed about. Try turning over turning your plate down. Consecrating yourself, dedicating your entirety of your week, your day, whatever, mm. to Christ. Mm. And you stand back and watch the manifestation <clears throat> of the Lord, you will be surprised. That's awesome. I feel like, but immediately to the other side. Mm. Thanks for sharing that, yeah. When, when I hear Mike explaining that, it, it, it kind of reminds me that it's like fill yourself with God 
instead of filling yourself with food. You know, so you create this empty place, you know, and not that he goes in your stomach, but, you know, but th there's this want and this need and it invites him in, in instead of taking something that's just worldly. Hmm. Yeah, the yes. scripture said, in your weakness. Mm -hmm. See, God can come down in your weakness mm -hmm. and he will make you strong. Amen. So let God be the glory. Amen. So I take the glory in my accomplishments or anything that I achieve. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen. Leanne. Uh, I was, I, I'm not going to compete with the Michael, but I wanted to say that something that? else as another Sorry. way of saying that. Um, my doctor told me I needed to go on statins, and I was like, no. <laughs> no. So she said, you can't control this. I died. Oh, you can. So I went on yeah, the can. for like about six months. And I she got my blood back and I wasn't type 2 diabetes and I wasn't cholesterol high. And she she didn't recognize me. She's like, you need a new picture because this isn't your picture anymore. Mm. So fasting is just, there's not just this aspect. Um, and plus there was a lot of the, what did you say? Convict, not convicted, but consecration. Consecration. There. there was a lot of God talking to me and, and ministering me. So, and I was happier as a person. Because once you well, start feeling better physically, you, know, yeah. you start becoming happier. So there's a lot of, um, you know, the keto diet, that's, that's what the Israelite diet is. Yep. So Steve Jobs died way too early. He started Apple. Some of y'all are Apple fans. He said, food will be your medicine or medicine will be your food. It came from Socrates, actually. It did originally? Yeah. The food be thy medicine. Socrates. Okay, right. Like 600 B.C. The principle's there. Mm -hmm. So... Thank you. Okay, so Nehemiah. How many remember the story of Nehemiah? He rebuilt all the broken down walls of Jerusalem. Amen? Mm -hmm. And it says of him that, um, that he, he too confessed his sins to God and turned away from them. And they were uh, praying and fasting. Nehemiah 1.4. I didn't put the exact scripture there. But anyway, it's Nehemiah 1.4. David fasted to ask God. Now this is a real good one here. I want you to hear this in real close. David asked God to intervene because of injustice. No, I got, I'm, a, I'm ahead of myself. This one. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting, and my prayer would return to my own heart. And this is talking about his enemies. I don't know if y'all know what uh, Psalm 35 is, but it's an imprecatory psalm. And those are the psalms where you get to pray curses and destruction of your enemies. And some people don't believe they should be in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Some people believe we're supposed to love our enemies and all that stuff Jesus says but there's a time when you have to go to war and basically there's a whole bunch of those psalms if you, if you need a list of them I'll be glad to give them to you <laughs> but the one that I really want to look at is 2 Samuel 12 2 Samuel 12 you know that he committed adultery with Bathsheba mm -hmm. right and Bathsheba got pregnant and had a boy and David went before the Lord and the Lord had said it's, this is going to cost you this, 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 and that. You're going to have trouble in your household. You're going to lose your firstborn, this boy, and everything. He fasted and asked for miraculous healing. And in verse 23, the boy died, so the request was not done the way he asked. Sometimes when we go to prayer and fasting, we ask for things that may not be God's will, but God's will will come through. Uh, it may not be the way you want it. Amen? And I wanted to throw that one out there for you, too. Mordecai and the Jews fasted upon hearing news of Haman's wicked plot for their extermination. How many remember the story of Esther? One night with the king. How many watched the movie? The ladies did. It's a really good movie. We watched it at home after y'all after y'all watched it here. It was so it's good. Anyway. Esther 4 3, and in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in salt, sackcloth and ashes, discomfort. They humbled themselves before God. And then the early church, 
You can, those of you can look up. And then I wanted to get down here. What does Jesus say about fasting? In Matthew 6, 16 and 18, He says, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance. What? Uh, you're walking around, oh man, I feel terrible, I'm so hungry, God, terrible. What's going on? Well, I'm fasting for the Lord. Bless, <laughs> bless God. I'm, I'm being real holy and sanctified and all that stuff. He says, don't be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. They want everybody to know they're fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Amen? But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Don't you love that verse? So everything I do without tooting my own horn, God's going to reward me openly. That's a real hard thing for some people to learn to do. Like, you know what I mean? Men like to toot their own horn sometimes. I guess women do too, but anyway. So now we're going to go back to Isaiah. We're going, we're going to finish this chapter. Oh, I got a lot of time. <laughs> Scott goes to 820 every time. He always says, oh, let's just do one more section. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's good. Good stuff. Isaiah 58, 9 and 12. Who would like to read that? Go ahead. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help. And he will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like your day. Keep going. Go to 12. Yep. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places. And make your bones strong, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. Hmm. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to live in. Wow, that's a good passage right there. So I want to back up to verse 9, but the second half of verse 9. I want you to look at the second half of verse 9, okay? And again, we're going to go back to God is going to exhort us to do something to get something. Okay? God honors obedience, so He's going to tell us to do something. And in the second half of 9, if you take away the yoke from your midst, what's the yoke? Something that's holding you back. What's holding you back from being all the way surrendered to God? Take away the yoke, the pointing of the finger, looking at everybody else and what's wrong with them. Don't look at me like that. And speaking wickedness. Amen. Somebody said it in our group. Uh, take the... I always get it backwards. Take the plank out of my own eye before I try to take the speck out of my brother's eye. Joyce Meyer always says telephone pole. I always had that vision. <laughs> if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted, afflicted soul, then your light, so he's telling you what to do, take away the yoke, stop pointing fingers, speak in wickedness, stop talking like a heathen. If you extend your soul to the hungry, go help the hungry person, satisfy the afflicted soul, then... Then comes the promise, your light will sh shall dawn in the darkness, your darkness shall be as the noonday. How many need the guidance of God? It says in verse 10 and 11, He will guide you continually. I need God's guidance. Anybody else needs God's guidance? Mm -hmm. And satisfy your soul in drought, and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a water garden. And I love this last part. You shall be called the repairer of the breach. Some of y'all have gone through some broken times, separation from God. And he says, I'm the repairer of the breach. Another uh, translation says, the repairer of broken down walls. So you've allowed the walls that keep you in line to come down. And God says, I'm going to repair the stuff that's happened in your life and restore it. Amen. Because the next verse says, 
I'm the restorer of the streets to dwell in. And when I was reading that, I was thinking about Nehemiah. Now, it doesn't say anything about Nehemiah relating to Isaiah 58, but he rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. And I, and I wonder if he thought of those verses because he did it in like 400 B.C., somewhere right in that era. And this was written in 680 to 700 B.C. And they had those scrolls. You know, you think of a breach uh, like a, a plank on a bridge and there's a gap and you can't cross that bridge because of the gap and it stops everything and that breach and when he says he's a repairer of the breach and which, which opens up that flow again you know and, and it's just a beautiful verse a repair of the breach it is a beautiful verse it's cool very good. Has everybody ever heard of that verse before? No. No? No, I think of a breach of security. Breach of security. You think of a what? Breach. Like bre breach of security? That's good. That's a good analogy. Well, if it was a breach in the wall, it would be a breach of security. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Because then your security is gone because that's where the enemy comes yeah. wandering right through. Yeah. Very good. Anybody else have any kind of, yeah? Yeah, well, Walter, you were saying God will be. I mean, this actually says, you shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. So it's God's actually empowering us, us yeah. to do that. Thank you. But there's some things that we have to do, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In order to get to that yeah, kind of, kind of goes along with Sunday's message, the authority of the believer. We have the power to go get these streets rebuilt and the breach repaired. And yes, we're the agents that God uses when we're obedient. Yeah, thanks. That's good. Okay, Isaiah 58, 13. We're going to finish this up in 14. Who would like to read that? Go ahead, Jared. Oh, go ahead. So he exhorted the people to do what? Keep the Sabbath. Yeah. Scott, Scott talked about it, was it two weeks ago when he did, or three? three? It was 56 of Isaiah. So it must have been two weeks ago. And what happened to America when we started, what they call them, the blue laws? Yeah. And uh, we started selling and became commercialized on Sundays and yeah. no more honoring of the Lord. Mm -hmm. It's just been a progression of things to watch America fall away. Mm -hmm. And that's a big one. God wants us to take a day of rest every week. Mm -hmm. Take a day of rest. You want to experience the Sabbath. Go to Israel. What's that? You want to experience the Sabbath the way it... Go to Israel. Yeah. You'll experience the Sabbath whether you want to or not. Sure. Everything, everything yeah. shuts down? Yeah, it does. You get a cold breakfast. <laughs> Is that right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the coffee. <laughs> oh, wow. I'll pass. Yeah. It's important to God to keep these, um, these laws. So anyway, and then the promise is that, that uh, it says, Then they will delight in the Lord who gave the day, and he will give them a place of leadership in the earth and the heritage that God promised to Jacob. Nothing can hinder this because the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Mm -hmm. And then, um, that's as far as we're going to go in Isaiah. I put down a few scriptures. And um, my friend Michael said sometimes they only come out by prayer and fasting. I actually had this down. It goes right along with what you said. So I'm going to read you a story. It's on your a confirmation. It's on your, exactly right. It's on your page. And it says, Lord, have mercy on my son. For he's an epileptic and suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. 
So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, I would hate for Jesus to say this to me, but he, he probably has a few times. Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. I wonder, if, I wonder if Jesus was real nice and soft. I don't think he was. I said, bring him to me. You know, frustrated. I've already told you all how to do all this stuff, and you're not doing it. <laughs> That's how I read it anyway. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why couldn't we cast it out, Jesus? <laughs> Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief. For surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing's impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Michael had a breakthrough because he honored the Lord through prayer and fasting. Came back out of it a different man. Mm -hmm. You know, uh he said in his word that in the latter days, in the last days, we will be able to do greater things than we in Christ. Is anybody else in here in expectation of that? Because I expect to be able to lay hands on people, my shadow to heal people. I believe that. Mm -hmm. I believe the word of God. I don't know what anybody else can do. But I'm, I, that's where, I, you know, I, I have my sights on those things. Yeah. Yeah, he does. He says the greater he says, um, the works that I do shall you do also, and greater works than these shall I do, because I go to the Father. So, and there's plenty of people that are believing just what Michael said that we're going to do greater things because of the power of the Holy Spirit living in us and the fellowship of Christ. We'll be able to do these things for people, lead them to the Lord. <laughs> An explanation about that whole mustard seed thing. And so many times we focus on the wrong thing. The tiny the, we focus on the idea that the mustard seed is so small and we can have if we only have that much faith, we can do all those things. But what the faith is is their mustard seed is the tiniest of seeds, but it grows into a really gigantic plant. So that's what our faith can do. Faith. Faith. Amen. Can grow from the tiniest to the tiny thing. And how do we get more faith? Somebody quote. Somebody quote me a scripture, huh? Faith comes by hearing. Yeah, there you go. Yep. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And then the last one I want to read about fasting, and it's kind of long, but that's okay. Does somebody else want to read? Kelburn. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up high on a mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you, and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. Mm. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against this stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, You shall not, not tempt the Lord your God. Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Wow. That's such a powerful passage of Scripture. So he fasted, and he went into the wilderness for 40 days. He was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. I love that because sometimes we're in the wilderness and we think, Why am I in the wilderness? Well, the Spirit led you there. 
And you may be in, you, and, in, and in the wilderness he was attacked by Satan there, it says. So you may have been led to the wilderness by the Spirit, but while you're in the wilderness you're getting attacked by Satan. Come on, Lord. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so, and then he comes back, and, and it, the first thing he hits him up with, uh, you know, command this stone to be bread. He was one hungry motor scooter. Jesus. Yeah. I haven't eaten anything in 40 days. Four days I'd be wanting a piece of bread. Even if it's bad bread, I'd say, yeah, give me that. <laughs> and he tempted him with where he would be his weakest physically. But Jesus was on a mountaintop spiritually because he had just fasted 40 days. He was soaring. Because <laughs> he knew all of this domain that we call planet earth is under the sway of the evil one. This is his domain. Yeah. The prince and the power of the air that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Ephesians chapter 2. The prince and the power of the air. This is his domain. That's why we need the authority of Christ to live and act out in this world according to Christ. Amen. So he came back weak in the flesh because he hadn't eaten, but he was strong in the spirit. And then the devil tempted him. And what did he say every time? It is written. It wasn't because he came up with some idea that was not you know, already there. He quoted eight Deuteronomy 8.3, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. If you don't get a hold of anything, get a hold of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, Walter, can I share something here? Sure. We just went over this in a Young Life group on Monday, and we were talking about temptations. And just before Jesus went to the desert, uh, he was baptized, and God said to him, the Holy Spirit descending as a dove, as a dove, came down. But the thing that I got out of this is Jesus said, Behold my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, over here, Satan doesn't say that. He says, If you are the Son of God, he left out the word beloved. And that's how he treats us. Satan doesn't want us to know how valuable we are. Mm. That's good. Thanks. Yeah, that's real good. But each time that Jesus was tempted, he always said, it is written. And I like it. I like that one, the last one. I like all of them. He says, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only serve. That was when he said, get behind me. But the last one is when uh, he offered him all of the kingdoms of the world. And um, he said, then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written. Now, who's quoting that right there? Satan. Yeah. So Satan will quote Scripture at you. He knows. He know, yeah, he knows the Scriptures. And then he quotes Psalm 91. Y'all know that's another one of my favorite Scriptures, Psalm 91. If you don't know it and read it and pray it over you and your family, start doing it. It's wonderful, powerful, powerful, powerful Psalm. He says, He will give your angels charge over you to keep you. And then he says, They'll bear you up in your hands lest you dash your foot against a stone. And so he's taken Scripture to trip him up. And Satan will do that to us sometimes. And that's all, folks. No altar call or nothing. Just Man, I got a minute left. <laughs> Thank you. But y'all can't leave yet. <laughs> Is there any, do I need to make an announcement? Any announcements I'm forgetting? Um, so many having to like prayer for all your children. I will, yeah, I will, yeah, so I'll, if you'll get with me after the service, I'll share with you how that will work. It's a very powerful way to, yep. Very good stuff. Yep, yep, yep. Who wants to pray us out? Amo, what? Oh, that's an announcement. I knew there was an announcement. Okay, everybody has to stick around. This is Scott. This isn't optional. Optional. You need to stay around after the service, and we got to move these chairs because we're having a banquet in here tomorrow. A speaker. Okay. We need some help. Okay. You're you're storing up treasures in heaven. Are we getting the tables out too? We're getting the tables out too. Okay.
Who wants to pray us out? Bill, you want to pray us out? Can you? Father, we thank you for this time, Lord. We thank you for the freedom to have a church and a pastor who opens your word, Lord, and guides us through it. No secrets, no fluff. The sharing of your word to hide in our hearts, to carry with us always, to be your children. We ask, Lord, that you bless us and keep us. Give us safety on our way home. Lord, we pray for those who aren't with us and mm. uh, for those people who have special needs. And there are many. We ask the Lord to be with each of us and especially those who need you so desperately. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Nice job.